Thanks. Uh, a whistle-stop tour, because there's a lot to cover. So uh, I apologize if I go through this fairly quickly. Um, first thing to say about post-operative radiotherapy for breast cancer is that uh, within the UK, uh, all the clinical leads of radiotherapy get together every five years or so and come up with consensus documents. Uh, they're a really useful resource, and I'd commend you to go to the college website and download them. Uh, you may find them helpful. The next thing I'd say is that uh, as someone who battles with different people within the private sector wanting to do all sorts of different things, it's important at the outset to understand that whole breast radiotherapy is still the standard of care for invasive breast cancer mm -hmm. following breast-conserving surgery. There's all sorts of different modalities available now, but you know, there's a lot of evidence to show that whole breast radiotherapy is very effective. So what are the benefits of adjuvant breast radiotherapy? Um, well, if you do a meta-analysis and you follow patients up long enough, and this is why research is so important, you can show that for every four recurrences avoided at 15 years, you can prevent a breast cancer death. So radiotherapy not only reduces local recurrence, it's actually going to prevent systemic recurrence at some point in the future as well, in a proportion of women. In terms of fractionation, uh, I was involved in this study back in uh, the turn of the century. The START trial looked at what was standard of care at the time, which was five weeks of radiotherapy, and there was an extreme shortage of radiotherapy machines at the time within the UK. This was around the time that Tony Blair started to invest and put more money into radiotherapy within the UK, but patients were waiting three months for radiotherapy treatment, so we had to try and do something. Um, this study compared three weeks of radiotherapy to five weeks of radiotherapy and basically showed that it was just as good. In fact, there was a hint that it was slightly better, but three weeks of radiotherapy, equally good from a cosmetic point of view and from a local occurrence point of view. And since then, the UK has really led the way in terms of doing further studies to see whether we can further hypofractionate radiotherapy. Uh, the fast forward study most recently, but also the fast trial, which looked at weekly radiotherapy, is clearly far more convenient for patients to have treatment over one week consecutive days. And clearly there are a proportion of patients who may develop problems over weeks so the quicker you can get the treatment in the better. You don't want patients getting infections or breast swelling and changing shape once you've planned the radiotherapy. We started using 26 grain five fractions during the COVID pandemic, and it's fair to say that it's now become standard of care for uh, whole breast radiotherapy, for chest wall radiotherapy, and for partial breast irradiation, but not for nodal radiotherapy as yet, and we'll come back to that. How do we plan radiotherapy? Everyone gets a CT scan in the treatment position. Uh, so you outline on your CT scan the soft tissue of the breast, from the skin surface, indeed five millimeters below the skin surface down to the deep fascia. Uh, you don't include the muscle or the rib cage. You grow what is a clinical target volume to a planning target volume by adding 10 millimeters because obviously respiration will have some impact and patients move around a little bit. And then you apply fields to cover what you want to treat. And that is basically what goes on on a day-to-day -day basis in every radiotherapy department in the country. There's always been concerns about radiotherapy, especially on left-sided tumours. Um, and this is a, a, a really good paper that shows that for every increased amount of radiotherapy you give to the heart, you increase the risk of heart damage and cardiac death in the future. So you absolutely want to try and minimise the amount of radiation that the heart uh, encounters. And clearly you need to outline the heart in order to be able to do that. And if you started radiotherapy in the 1990s, we weren't using CT scans to plan radiotherapy, and we really had no idea how much heart was receiving radiotherapy at all. Clearly, if you have other coronary risk factors, you're at an even greater risk of developing coronary death. Uh, and having learned that the heart is uh, a critical organ, we now use what's called deep inspiratory breath holding, so patients are encouraged to hold their breath for 20 to 30 seconds at a time whilst they receive radiotherapy. There's machinery in the room that they can monitor. They can actually see whether they're holding their breath the right amount. And the machines can sense when they breathe. So when they start breathing again, the machines stop, corrects back a little bit. And when they're ready to hold their breaths again, they hold their breath again. And the radiographers will then start the machine again, and they'll carry on until they finish their treatment. Deep inspiratory breath holding is now standard of care for left-sided tumors. Uh, in some centers, we do it in the right side as well, because clearly, although we're not going to spare the heart, we will reduce the amount of lung and liver that receives radiotherapy treatment. And some centers are believers that if you can minimize the amount of radiotherapy to organs at risk, you've got to be able to do that. If you can do it, you might as well do it. 
little bit about the tumour bed boost. Uh, boosting is really only relevant for women over the, under the age of 50, although some centres still do boost patients with high-risk pathologies if they're over 50. Uh, classically, it's been given by a different form of radiotherapy called electron beams, but you can deliver it by reducing your standard radiation fields and using what are called mini-tangents. Uh, there's a prescribed dose that you can give, but clearly if you want to give that quicker, you can adjust the dose accordingly and you can hypofractionate. Or you can use intensity modulated radiotherapy, which is really the way that a lot of centres are going these days, and deliver the radiotherapy at the same time that you're delivering your standard 15 fraction radiotherapy treatment. Uh, there are centres that are starting to look at using simultaneous integrated boosts, even using 26 grain 5 fraction and adding radiotherapy onto the area that you want to give a higher dose of radiotherapy to. This is why we give a boost. It doesn't really have an impact on overall survival, but it certainly reduces local recurrence. Uh, and the greatest benefit is seen in women under the age of 40. And it doesn't take a rocket scientist to realize that if you're under the age of 40, you're going to live longer and you've got more chance of seeing a local recurrence. And that's why they benefit more than older women do. Uh, there's a, a classic setup where uh, if you reduce local recurrence, that's great. But of course, you're going to improve, increase the risks of severe fibrosis within the breast. And, talking to a, what is a majority of audience of surgeons, you don't want increased fibrosis because you want good cosmesis. So there's a balance to be had. Can radiotherapy be omitted? More UK research, in fact, Scottish research, Ian Kunkler's study, the PRIME2 trial, looked at whether you could eliminate radiotherapy in certain groups. And again, there's a classic playoff here. You can omit radiotherapy, but you are going to see increased amounts of local recurrence, but no increase in death. So yes, if you're selective with radiotherapy, and you're se then you need to be able to talk to your patients and explain to them. They are more likely to get a local recurrence, but as long as they're willing to accept that, it's unlikely to impact upon their survival. Partial breast radiotherapy, again, uh, led out by Charlotte Coles in Cambridge. Uh, this study called the Import Low Study shows that you can give low doses of radiotherapy just to the quadrant where the tumor was in certain subtypes, but with important caveats. You don't want to be doing this for lobular cancer. You don't want to be doing this in women with lymphovascular invasion. But if you select your patients, you get very low local recurrence rates indeed. Some people do this a lot. Some people do it a little. I tend to use it in women who've got very large breasts because I have to say, if you've got a very large breast, you're far more likely to get inframammary desquamation and you've got a tumour in the top half of the breast and you want to avoid the lower half of the breast, then partial breast irradiation is a fantastic tool. Having said that, with hypofractionation, we see less inframammary desquamation now than we ever used to see when we gave 50 grain 25 fractions or even 40 grain 15 fractions. So these new hypofractionated regimes deliver safe, effective radiotherapy with less acute toxicity. Uh, indications for chest wall radiotherapy after mastectomy. Well, I was taught that it was a tumour greater than five centimetres or if you had four more lymph nodes or if you had positive margins and that there were some relative indications. And we were really crying out for some data and the important data came from the meta-analysis in 2014. And that showed that if you had no nodal involvement, you didn't really need chest wall radiotherapy afterwards. But if you had any form of nodal involvement, you did benefit from radiotherapy treatment. And the series above shows women with one to three lymph nodes involved, and the series below shows women with four or more lymph nodes. And there are clear improvements in both local regional recurrence, any first recurrence, and indeed in breast cancer mortality if you deliver radiotherapy treatment. And so if you have any form of lymph node involvement these days, chest wall radiotherapy has become very much a standard of care. Chest wall radiotherapy with reconstruction, I'm not going to go into this too much because you know far more about it than I do, but clearly uh, there's an increased risk of complications if you give radiotherapy to a reconstruction and all patients are consented about that. There's an increased risk of implant rupture, there's loss of implants. Even if you have an autologous reconstruction, there are fewer complications, but there are still complications. Uh, and to me, where we're going with this is there's going to need to be research done and uh, Fiona McNeil and uh, colleagues are looking at that, they've already published in Prada and they're trying to set up a bigger study. Uh, and I would encourage you to put patients into that study looking at giving radiotherapy uh, before reconstructive surgery rather than after reconstructive surgery and just switching the temporal delivery of radiotherapy and seeing whether that's going to impact and hopefully maintain good local control without the complications that radiotherapy can cause to reconstructive surgery. 
uh, I was told we shouldn't have slides, so I've included two. Uh, DCIS, uh, high grade above, low grade below. The role of radiotherapy in DCIS is really quite difficult. Um, clearly, there are all sorts of different ways of looking at it, but standardly, we do offer adjuvant radiotherapy, and again, it's the classic 26 grade, five fractions. You can also consider adjuvant endocrine therapy. That's the nice guidance. Most oncologists in the UK don't use endocrine treatments for DCIS, and the reason for that is it doesn't benefit anybody. There's no increased survival by giving endocrine treatments, and you've got to deal with all the problems of patients who are on endocrine treatments, so we tend not to. Uh, this is the meta-analysis. The meta-analysis of DCIS shows that it's an extremely effective treatment. It halves the rate of ipsilateral breast events. There isn't a survival benefit, but half of those ipsilateral breast events are invasive, and clearly they will then need to potentially have adjuvant treatment. Uh, there's a 15% absolute risk reduction of breast recurrence at 10 years if you delay, deliver radiotherapy after breast, con surgery, breast conserving surgery for DCIS. Uh, slightly greater benefit if you're over the age of 50, bizarrely, but um, generally radiotherapy given to all. But clearly we recognize that there are going to be some women who have low-risk breast cancer, and we've got to start trying to pick out which women can potentially safely avoid radiotherapy. Uh, and uh, we've already heard very eloquently that there are certain genetic studies that one can do now on DCIS to determine whether you have a high risk or a low risk DCIS. And there are some commercially available models, and Oncotype offer one, and Decision RT offer one. And I think we're going to see more use of those tools over the next few years as well. Finally, nodal radiotherapy. We know that if you have no lymph node involvement or micrometastases, you don't require further auxiliary treatment. And the arguments are going to carry on raging as to whether you do or don't need further auxiliary treatment if you have macro metastases. Um, I think this is all about discussing very carefully with your patients what the best options are. And certainly some patients require surgery, and there are certainly some people who don't need surgery, even if they have macro metastases. And really it's about using the evidence that's there, waiting for further evidence to become available, such as from the POSNOC study, and in between very carefully explaining to your patients what the benefits of the different modalities are or whether you need radiotherapy at all. And I, you know, I was brought up to say you've got to avoid auxiliary recurrence, but with modern, effective endocrine, chemotherapy, and other adjuvant treatments, auxiliary recurrences are vanishingly rare. I don't remember the last time I saw one, and I treat a lot of breast cancer. Indications for supraclavicular fossa radiotherapy, more than three lymph nodes involved, lymph node involvement after neoadjuvant chemotherapy, if the apical lymph node's involved, or if you have a large tumor and only one or two lymph nodes are involved. Classically, we still use 40 gray and 15 fractions. There is data, we're just waiting for it from fast forward nodal. So uh, there is three year data that was presented at ESTRO last year. We're waiting for five year data. Certainly some of the people who are big within FAST are already starting to use 20 gray, 26 grade and 5 fractions. They're convinced that it's going to be just as effective as 40 and 15. But at the moment, it's still a three-week course of radiotherapy if you're irradiating the nodes. And then regional nodal radiotherapy. Uh, old data has always supported this, but there was an increased risk of death because, again, of cardiac toxicity in the main. Uh, two big studies, one by Philip Portmans and, and the other, the Canadian study from Whelan, showed that regional nodal radiotherapy where you irradiated the supraclavicular, the internal mammary lymph node chain, and indeed the lymph nodes above the auxiliary clearance. So it's not a light undertaking, and all you're in effect doing is increasing the risk of nasty side effects from radiotherapy by doing it. So you do have to pick and choose your patients quite carefully. But there is a survival advantage, and this is going to be updated, I believe, either towards the end of this year or early next year in an update of the Oxford meta-analysis that shows that consistent survival advantage if you have high-risk breast cancer from delivering regional nodal radiotherapy. It has its challenges, but it is worth doing, and it should be being discussed at multidisciplinary meetings. It shouldn't be up to an oncologist by themselves to decide. Who should have regional nodal radiotherapy? Well, the college consensus says if you've got a T4 tumor, if you've got N2 disease, or if you have a large or a medial tumor and one to three lymph nodes, you should certainly consider regional nodal radiotherapy. They all require deep inspiratory breath holding to reduce the amount of radiotherapy given to the lung or to the heart. You need to use ESTRO guidelines to very carefully outline the nodes that you want to use. Don't 
do it in an arbitrary fashion, try and be consistent. And clearly, we're waiting for the results of the NSADP B51 study that will hopefully tell us whether there's a role for radiotherapy if you've had a complete pathological response but had previous nodal involvement and then subsequently had neoadjuvant chemotherapy treatment. And that is my lot. Thank you very much for your attention.